Good morning, and welcome to our video devotion for Thursday, October the 28th, 2021. Hope that you're having a good week and will enjoy a great weekend. But right, like right now, let's take another deep dive into God's Word. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, we're going to begin at the very first verse. You know, it's interesting, in the early chapters of Romans, Paul addresses some serious theological issues, including the nature of salvation itself. In the final two chapters of Romans, Paul goes on to talk about some more practical matters. In chapter 14, Paul talks about specifically about some of the principles for living together as a church family. So let's see what the Bible says here. Accept him whose faith is weak. Now the word accept means to be received with approval or pleasure. So who is the church supposed to receive with approval and pleasure? Look at what it says. The one whose faith is weak. Let me try and explain what Paul means when he talks about a Christian whose faith is weak. Basically, he's talking about someone who is immature in their faith. People who are still struggling with what it means to live a Christian life. Now, let's be honest with ourselves here for a minute. Most churches aren't looking for new members whose faith is weak. Because people like that require lots of time and effort and energy. At worst, they can be a major source of dissension and conflict in the church. The truth is, most churches wish immature believers would just go somewhere else. But here's the thing. If we're not willing to help a baby Christian become the person who God created them to be, who will do it? That's why Romans 14.1 says, Give a warm welcome to any brother who wants to join you, even those whose faith is weak. That's the way it's placed. It's said in the Living Bible. You know, there's one thing that we always need to remember. Not a single one of us is a finished product. At the end of the day, we're all just believers who were struggling to press on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Well, let's read on. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. You know, Satan desperately wants to disrupt the unity and fellowship of the church. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible warns, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You know, over the years, Satan has learned to exploit the differences between immature and mature Christians to create conflict and dissension in the church. For instance, weak members may wind up harshly judging those brothers and sisters who don't share their personal convictions, while more mature members can sometimes look down on weak Christians for being immature and misguided in their faith. One reason the gift of tongues is so controversial is because many Christians who practice that gift come to believe that it is the essential gift of the Holy Spirit. They think that if you don't speak in tongues, like they do, you aren't really saved. On the other hand, there are Christians who criticize those who speak in tongues as being immature and even sacrilegious. Well, look at what the Bible goes on to say in verse 3. Beginning with verse 2, excuse me. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. The issue in the church at Rome may have, not, may have been Jewish dietary laws and the observance of religious holidays, but the principle is universal. A Christian should exercise caution before judging another person's personal convictions. Understand, we're not talking about the fundamental truths of the gospel here. When the truth of the gospel was at stake, Paul never backed down. But when the issue concerned a matter that had no bearing on the question of salvation, Paul took an entirely different approach. Two passages of Scripture illustrate what I'm talking about here. First, we're, we're going to turn to Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Now, I want you to listen here to how Paul confronts a situation that had arisen in the church at Antioch. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. 
Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? All right. Now I want you to listen to the way Paul handled a question about marriage in the church in Corinth. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verses 25 through 28. Now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for you to remain as you are. Are you married? Do not seek a divorce. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you will not have sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Do you see the point in all of this? If an issue threatened the very nature of the gospel, the people of God must be like Paul and never compromise. God expects us to draw a line in the sand and stand up for the truth. But besides those essential truths, God expects you to take a live and let live attitude towards brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen to what the Bible goes on to say. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Now, here is where it gets really tricky. On the one hand, Christians enjoy a wonderful freedom that we must preserve at all costs. But, on the other hand, while you're celebrating your freedom from, with Christ you have to be careful not to become a stumbling block for another believer. This is why the Bible says that we should exercise our Christian freedom very carefully. I like the way Warren Wearsby puts it. He says, the believer who holds on to his questionable practice and causes another Christian to fall in his walk with God is blind to the price Jesus paid on the cross. To put it another way, it's a sin to tear down another believer's spiritual life so that you can flaunt your personal freedom. What you are doing may be perfectly lawful, but don't forget that as a Christian, you have an, a, a, an obligation to obey a higher law, a greater law, and that is the law of love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, the Bible says, Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Well, why don't we let Jesus have the final word in this matter? He said in Matthew, Mark chapter 9, verse 42, if anyone causes these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. Look at what Romans 14 says in verse 19. It says, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Now to understand what God's word is saying here, let's break this verse down. It says, Let us therefore make every effort Effort implies a deliberate and spiritual decision to exert spiritual and physical energy. In this case, the effort is not supposed to be directed at criticizing or tearing down another Christian. Instead, the effort is to be focused on things that lead to peace and mutual edification. You know, every Sunday morning we close our worship hour here at Sunset Road by singing, They'll Know We're Christians by Our Love. You know, that needs to be the essence of our witness in the world. More than anything else, the people who are lost are looking at us 
to see if we really do know how to live at peace and harmony with one another. That's why the Word of God says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that we will be careful to practice our freedom in a way that does not hurt another believer. And we pray, Father, that we will disciple one another to become the people that you have called us to be. And Father, we pray that we will work and make all efforts to build one another up in such a way that others will see Jesus in us. Father, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Jesus, we love you. And we make this prayer in your name. Amen. I want to thank you for joining with me this morning. It's been my pleasure to share these words with you. And I hope that God will use them to bless you today. I also want to remind you that we have a special event planned for the church this weekend. On Saturday evening from 6 to 8 o'clock, we'll be having a trunk or treat on the church parking lot. You can bring the kids in their costumes and let them go from car to car for a safe alternative to trick-or-treating. Finally, don't forget that I'll be dropping another devotion on Saturday morning. Until then, have a blessed and happy day. I love you. Bye-bye. Thank you.